Welcome back to Beyond the Patterns. So today I have the great pleasure to announce Florian Wilomitzer as an invited speaker in our series. Florian is a research assistant professor at Northwestern University. He graduated from our university where he received his PhD with honors, summa cum laude, in 2017. During his doctoral studies, Florian investigated physical and information theoretical limits of optical 3D sensing and implemented sensors that operate close to these limits. At Northwestern University, Florian and his students develop novel techniques to overcome traditional resolution limitations and dynamic range restrictions in 3D and 2D imaging. Moreover, Florian's research is focused on new methods to image hidden objects through scattering media or around corners, high-resolution holographic displays, and the implementation of high-precision metrology methods in low-cost mobile handheld devices. Florian is currently chair of the OSA COSI conference and has served as a reviewer for OSA, IEEE, SPIE and the Nature Portfolio. His PhD thesis was awarded with the Springer Thesis Award for Outstanding PhD Research. So it's a great pleasure to have you here, Florian. And today we will see a presentation by you that is entitled Fundamental Limits in Computational 3D Imaging from Novel 3D Cameras to Looking Around Corners. I'm very much looking forward to this presentation and Florian, the stage is yours. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Andreas, uh, for this very nice introduction and um, good afternoon to Erlangen from my side. So first of all, I have to say that I'm extremely excited uh, to be invited to Bay, uh, today and to be back to my former university, uh, even if it's like just virtual this time, unfortunately. So again, my name is Florian Willumitzer, and I'm currently working as research assistant professor at Northwestern University in the computational photography lab. And in my talk today, I'm going to talk about the virtue of fundamental limits in computational 3D imaging. And I will show you this virtue at the example of three of my research projects. But before I start, I will shortly introduce Northwestern University and our group. So Northwestern University is located in Evanston, Illinois, which is approximately like a 30 minutes drive away from Chicago. And as you can see, it has like a lovely campus directly on the shore of Lake Michigan. And here on this image, you can even see Chicago in the background. Um, of course, all the work that I'm going to talk about today uh, was not done in a one-man show, of course. Yeah, um, this is always a group effort, and um, which is why I want to give credit uh, to my great co-workers here, especially to our lab director Oliver Kossert, but also to the co-workers that are not part of our current lab, which is shown on this slide here. And um, for one project that I'm showing today, I especially want to emphasize uh, our colleagues from Prasanna Rangarian's lab at SMU. And uh, for the last project that I'm showing today that was done during my PhD thesis in Erlangen, I of course also want to give credit to all my colleagues there and especially to my PhD uh, advisor, Gerd Häusler, who basically introduced me in this uh, thinking in limits that I will share with you today. So why are limits so important? Uh, there are actually many uh, examples to motivate this. And I just picked a few where I think many people in the audience might be familiar with. So uh, what you see here are some examples from uh, computer vision. So you see some examples from gesture estimation, scene understanding in uh, autonomous mapping. Uh, medical imaging even, or uh, robotic AR-assisted surgery. And if you think a little bit about how all this has developed in recent years, 
And actually with which speed all this constantly improves, you just get uh, very deeply impressed and very excited. And if you think a little bit more about this, all these exciting developments uh, trigger in turn many exciting questions. So questions that you could ask can be, where does this all end? Does this just get better and better? And can you basically do everything uh, just by improving your algorithm or finding a data set which is large enough? Or are there limits of what you can do? And if yes, where are those limits? And trying to answer this question and eventually developing imaging and display devices that work close at these limits is a central cornerstone of my research. And um, by the way, the question for limits is by far not only an academic question. So, I mean, I don't want to sound overly dramatic here, but if you just look at these two examples of robotic surgery or uh, autonomous navigation, uh, the question about limits can very fast turn into a life and death question. So, in short, the knowledge about limits prevents us from trying to make an unnecessary technical effort to build impossible machines. So here's a funny example for this uh, that I took from physics class in school. Yeah, I mean, at least uh, some physics teachers might think this is funny, um, but what this example basically tells us, regardless if it's funny or not, is um, if somebody tells you about a fridge that uh, cools below zero Kelvin, you know that this must be fake news because this would violate uh, the limits of thermodynamics. And I mean, the fridge here is only a toy example, of course, but the modern technical development has reached dimensions where this is not so funny anymore. So for example, if you think of the particle accelerator at CERN, um, you do not want to build such a thing if you know that what you are trying to do with this machine is basically not possible. And the reason why the knowledge of limits is actually very handy is because limits often come in the shape of uncertainty products. So for example, the famous Heisenberg uncertainty product that we see here. And um, such products make it possible to bargain with nature for a better measurement of one quantity by trading off the precision of another quantity. And in the end, such uncertainty products form then the basis for a physical optimization of a setup towards a specific goal. So why are limits so important in imaging? Um, I also prepared a short warm-up example here. So let's say your friend is a photographer and he approaches you as imaging scientist because um, he is somehow unsatisfied with the resolution of his photos. So he basically says that fine details of the objects cannot be properly resolved. And what he's thinking of is uh, he's thinking of buying the latest DSLR camera body with, a, I don't know, 25 megapixel resolution or something like that. Uh, and he asks you, is this a good idea? And the answer is, you don't know. You don't know before you had a closer look at the system. And the system in this case is uh, simplified as a lens and a CCD and CMOS chip or a CMOS chip here. And um, let's say after closer observation, you see that the lens blur is so strong that uh, the blurring spot of a single object point is already spread over multiple pixels here. So in this case, the answer is it would not make sense to buy a chip with higher resolution since the structures which are smaller than the blurring spot, they cannot be resolved anyway. So what we have to do in this case is we have to swap the objective. And um, the way how an opticist thinks about this problem is in terms of the so-called space bandwidth product, SBP. And this is defined by the image dimension divided by the smallest uh, resolvable distance. And this gives you the number of independently resolvable points in the image, or in other words, the degrees of freedom. And in our example here, this number is not the number of pixels. It's actually smaller, right? And um, what I just told you is basically already the basic recipe how to optimize optical systems. So what you do is you identify the bottleneck of the information that flows through the system. And then you look how far you can improve this component without hitting a physical limit. And this thinking in limits is basically reflected 
in the research projects that I'm working on together with my students and my collaborators. So um, the slide is pretty crowded, but as you can see, uh, the broader field of research here is computational imaging or computational photography, also 3D metrology, technical optics and uh, 3D display applications. And the principles and devices which are developed here uh, can be used in a multitude of fields, including medicine, automotive, forensics, cultural heritage, industry or AR, VR applications. And um, at the same time, you see um, that these projects here actually span a pretty wide range between basic research and applied research and development. And you also see that many of them are based on 3D imaging. And this is actually not a coincidence, uh, which brings up the question, um, why is it so beneficial to work on 3D data? And why not just take a simple 2D photo of the object that you want to examine? And the answer is that uh, 3D images are robust to a lot of problems that you can have with 2D images. For example, they are robust against uh, perspectivic effects, such as translation, rotation, or foreshortening. Uh, they are robust against varying illumination conditions and also against surface albedo and reflectance variation. So in short, the information content of a 3D image is simply much higher. And um, this is not at least because um, uh, a much larger dynamic range, uh, which can easily reach uh, over 20 bit for a 3D image instead of like uh, 8 bit or so for a 2D image. And um, this fact is exploited in most of these projects. And um, for today's talk, I picked three projects that I'm going to talk about. Um, and these three projects nicely subsample this range uh, between applied and basic research. And I will first talk about the larger body of work of uh, 3D scanning with commodity devices, which is a project that has a great potential for future remote applications. It becomes now increasingly important uh, in the times of Corona. Um, after that, I will talk about synthetic wavelength holography, which is a novel method to image objects uh, through scattering media or around corners. And uh, after that, I will talk about the single shot 3D movie camera, which is a 3D sensor for fast and precise uh, 3D scanning that I have worked on during my PhD thesis in Erlangen. And um, since some of these projects are a little bit optics heavy, uh, and this might not be the bread and butter business for all people here in the audience, uh, I will always give a gentle introduction uh, to the topic in front of each project. Okay. So let's dive uh, right into the first project, which is about uh, high quality 3D sensors um, that are using only hardware, which is already present in every household, like a mobile phone or a tablet or a screen uh, paired with a webcam. And uh, the motivation behind this is that even if the image quality of these devices might not be the best, you still get a much better result as you would achieve uh, just by taking a photo of the object uh, from multiple positions and then running like a stereo or shape from shifting algorithm. And a very important point that I want to drive home here is that the illumination actually plays a very important role in this process. And um, this is, by the way, true for all projects that I'm going to show today. So 3D imaging with uh, commodity devices. How did this start? Um, originally, we developed this for a cultural heritage application, which was to determine the provenance of stained glass pieces in larger glass artworks. So for example, in church windows. And before I started with this project, I actually thought that uh, stained glass is only colored glass, uh, but this is actually not true because some stained glass pieces have a unique three-dimensional structure or unique three-dimensional patterns imprinted. And what we ultimately want to do is we want to measure this 3D structure somehow. And then later we want to match it to a specific manufacturer, basically like a fingerprint. Uh, the problem here is that simple 2D photos of the glass are not enough because uh, the color texture of the glass often spoils the visibility of the pattern, as you can see here. 
So what we need in this case is we need a measurement principle that can measure a broad variety of specular surfaces. And this is actually pretty difficult because uh, most 3D sensors use point light sources or a projector where the light also comes from one point. So it might happen that for specular objects, the signal never finds its way back into the camera, regardless of the camera or the projector position. And this brings up the question, why can we see specular objects at all? Now, yeah, let's take a stroll through Chicago and find out. So this, what you see here, this is the very famous cloud gate in Chicago. And I think everybody of you is able to see that it's shaped like a bean. And this is exactly the reason why many Chicagoans call it the bean. So this is very creative. But the question is, why do we actually know that it's shaped like a bean? Because why do we actually see that? Because I just told you that uh, specular objects are invisible. Well, we can tell the shape uh, because our brain uses prior information about the environment. So our brain uh, knows that the horizon here that we see should be horizontal and that these skyscrapers that we see here, they should be straight and so on and so forth. And our brain uses this information to calculate the shape of the object. So the solution to our previous dilemma is we have to pick our light source smart. We have to make our light source larger. We have to extend it, uh, make it a screen if even possible, make it as large as possible. And uh, then we display a pattern of our choice on the screen, for example, the sinusoidal pattern here. And then we observe the reflection of the pattern over the specular surface with a camera. And from the deformation of the pattern in the camera image, we can basically calculate the surface normal uh, of the specular surface. And uh, this is the basic principle of deflectometry, uh, which was already practiced by my old group in Erlangen for many, many years. And what we did is we took this well-established principle and built a 3D scanner for everybody. So I have to say that uh, normally deflectometry uh, requires very elaborate calibration, which uh, also involves some computational optimization. And what we did is we kind of hacked the measurement principle in a way that there is actually no calibration necessary and we implemented everything on a tablet. And you can see two initial results here. And you actually see how nice these uh, glass structures can be seen in the captured normal maps. And I also have to add that these models were actually pretty easy to capture. So you just place your mobile device over the glass and uh, start the measurement. And on the other hand, I had a pretty hard time to capture these comparison 2D photographs uh, since the patterns that you see here, they became only very obvious under very special lighting conditions. And um, another big problem if you do deflectometry with a small screen is the limited spatial and angular coverage of the screen. Because I just told you uh, in the ideal case, you should pick the screen as large as possible, which is not possible if you have like a mobile device, right? Uh, and this leads to uh, the fact that parts of the object surface cannot be measured from one single position, as you can see here. And for this, uh, we developed a software-sided solution that uses image registration and a kind of a panoramic stitching algorithm to stitch together single normal maps that were measured from different positions and uh, different viewing angles. And uh, this finally allows for the measurement of extended objects much larger than the initial field of view with high surface frequencies, like this very large glass artwork here uh, that was stitched together from 14 different single views. So um, this is all pretty nice, but the reason why this project is so intriguing to me is the huge potential of the general idea. Because the idea to use the screen and the front camera of any device for a high quality 3D measurement is actually much greater. So for example, you could use your computer screen and your webcam to do some kind of 3D video conferencing. This is hardware that right now everybody uh, sits up, like of us, everybody sits in front of this hardware, right? 
And in fact, we extended uh, the method to be able to capture matte objects like human skin, um, which in turn triggers, uh, which in turn triggers many new applications uh, here that become especially important in the times of COVID, like the fabrication of these uh, snug fit protective masks, for example, that you see here, or uh, teledermatology applications to detect skin cancer. So these are actually two things that we are working on right now. And I also quickly want to mention that we have applied our measurement techniques uh, in the past on another uh, cultural heritage problem to monitor uh, acne-like protrusions in paintings. And this actually created a fair amount of media coverage also in Germany. And I have linked the related articles here on my website uh, in case if you are interested. Okay, uh, before we move on to the next project, um, I quickly want to elaborate a little bit more on the importance of the illumination for optical 3D sensors. So we just saw that it makes a big difference for the captured data, uh, which light source I choose for which application. And the question is now if we can generalize this a little bit more. And what helps us here is uh, Shannon's transmission model for communication systems. And this is actually something that is very well known in information theory. And it basically describes how source information is encoded so that it can pass the noise affected communication channel without too many losses. And then it's decoded on the other side where the information should be delivered. The gag is now that we can describe an optical sensor system, like for example, a 3D sensor as communication channel as well. So here, the object surface information is encoded. It's transferred through optics and electronics, and later it's decoded with an algorithm that calculates the 3D data. And the most crucial component here is the encoder. And the encoder, that is actually the role of the illumination. So the illumination actually serves as source encoder for the 3D information. And this can be very powerful. And the most impressive example for this that I always uh, tell people about when uh, I, I talk about this is a bright field, dark field, phase contrast imaging, phase contrast imaging, uh, which you might know originally comes from microscopy, but um, similar techniques are also used in X-ray or CT imaging today, for example. So you might not really be able to see this, but uh, these are some bacteria. And what happens now if you observe the same object with the same camera and just slightly change your illumination encoder, you can go from this image to this image. Wow. So what do we learn from this? Actually, what we learn is that if we choose our illumination modality wisely, we, uh, this can obviously lead to very powerful improvements, which are also very important for further processing. And the next project I'm going to introduce is actually a great example for this. And this is the um, single shot 3D movie, uh, single shot 3D movie camera project. Sorry, I was just looking at the chat, but I think we will cover this later. Yeah, and this is the sing uh, sorry, this is the not the single shot 3D movie camera. This is the synthetic wavelength holography project, of course, um, which is a novel method um, to tackle the new and exciting problem of imaging around corners and uh, imaging through scattering media. So this slide here, um, this is like a kind of teaser slide that uh, shows the future potential of this new research field. So if you would have a sensor that uh, could look around corners, you could detect uh, obscured objects on curvy streets, for example, or you could build like a kind of optical endoscope um, to detect defects. Uh, these are only a few examples, of course, but basically what you want to do here is you want to turn walls into mirrors. And for imaging through scattering media on the right side, you could, for example, monitor the beating heart through the breast, or you could look at uh, brain vessels through the skull. Of course, uh, without using x-rays or an MRI or something like that, basically just with visible 
or nearly right. And um, if you think a little bit about these two problems, you uh, realize here that both sides here actually share exactly the same problem. And the problem is that light is scattered basically in all directions and completely loses its spatial structure during the scattering process. And people came up with the idea pretty quickly that instead of spatially structuring the illumination, like the structured light principles that we saw before, uh, they should look at the time of flight of the light. So basically they should measure the path lengths that the light travels from the sensor or from the source to the wall, from the wall to the object, back to the wall, and then back to the detector. And what I would like to do now is I would like to give you a quick recap now how most commercially available time of flight sensors work so that you can appreciate the difference to our principle a little bit better. So how these commercially available time of flight sensors work is you have a light source here, the LED, and the emission of this light source is uh, rapidly modulated in time with a sinusoidal function. And you have a camera with a special sensor architecture that is fast enough to detect these modulations. So how do you use it now to measure depths? Now, yeah, you shoot the modulated light towards the object uh, where it is reflected back to the camera and detect it. And um, since the light took some time to travel back and forth in the scene, you observe this phase shift phi between the detected signal and your clock signal here. And from this phase shift and uh, the known wavelengths lambda of the sinusoid, you can basically directly calculate the depths. Of course, uh, you also make an error in the phase estimation. And this error basically defines the depth error of your measurement. How can we bring this error down? Um, the answer can be already seen here. So you need to go to smaller wavelengths lambda because as you can see, the depth error is directly proportional to lambda. The problem is here that um, due to limitations in silicon manufacturing technology, the smallest wavelengths that can be actually achieved with these time of flight cameras is on the orders of like tens of centimeters, uh, which results in a depth error of around one centimeter. There are alternatives. Um, if we look at the other end of the spectrum, there is another uh, time of flight principle, which is uh, well known in optical metrology. This is uh, interferometry. And interferometry is not using a modulated light source at all. It is using the oscillations of the complex physical wave light field itself. So it works with very small optical wavelengths up to several microns. And it is like very precise uh, up to nanometers resolution. But the drawback here is that conventional interferometry uh, cannot be used on rough surfaces because of a very fundamental optical effect, which is called speckle. So what is speckle? Uh, just a quick recap or just a quick explanation for those who haven't heard of this effect before. So if we shine coherent light from a laser, for example, on a rough surface, uh, then the surface roughness introduces path length variations uh, that lead to this wavefront aberrations psi here. And according to these wavefront aberrations, uh, the backscattered light uh, does not form a clear wavefront anymore. So we have multipath interference effects. And these multipath interference effects uh, form uh, interference maxima in space that have the shape of uh, such cigars. And this is called speckle. And if you put an imager here, um, it's basically like cutting out a slice of this cigar field. The problem is now that um, the phase of the speckle field, uh, which you rely on because it tells you something about the time of travel, the phase is completely randomized and it gives you no information about the time of flight anymore. And in case you are like not so, not so familiar with optics, you can basically think of a speckle as a multiplicative noise um, that is so strong that your signal is basically buried in noise. So signal to noise ratio one. And um, by the way, you have exactly the same problem uh, in scattering media because uh, the scatterer also introduces path length variations. There is a condition to avoid speckle. And this condition is that the maximal wavefront aberrations uh, should be smaller than one quarter of the wavelengths 
Uh, but you can already understand that for optical wavelengths, this can only be reached uh, for nearly mirror-like surfaces because these wavelengths are just uh, so small. So what we ultimately need now for our, for our principle is we need a wavelength that is larger than optical wavelengths, but smaller than time of light wavelengths. And fortunately, this huge gap that we see here can be closed by exploiting principles that are known from dual wavelengths interferometry. And this is exactly what we are doing. So our approach exploits encoding at different optical illumination frequencies. What does this mean? Uh, this means if we superimpose two lasers with slightly different wavelengths, we produce a high frequency wave with a low frequency beat node. And you might remember this concept uh, from physics class in school. In, in German, it's called Schwingung, um, and it's normally demonstrated there with sound waves. And what we are able to do now is by special detection methods uh, that I will not talk about today, we are actually able to electronically isolate the speed wave and thus to create a low frequency synthetic wave. And we use this uh, very old principle uh, to do something very new and exciting, namely holography through scattering scenes. And this works as follows. So um, we shine light at the two wavelengths towards the scatterer. Scatterer this, in this case can be a wall or it can be a diffuser or it can be a cloud. Does not really matter if the scattering is happening in reflection or in transmission. Then the light is scattered. Uh, we have two speckle patterns that illuminate the object. Um, the rough object surface creates another speckle pattern that again hits the scatterer. <clears throat> and after the last scattering process, we have two completely scrambled wavefronts with an aberration psi that is actually much larger than one wavelength. And the only thing we can measure here are these complex speckle fields at the two wavelengths. So each speckle field for itself uh, would not contain any information about the hidden object at all, since we already saw that the phase and the amplitude are completely scrambled. Now comes the trick. The things change if we take the two fields and synthesize this correlation term here. And this correlation term contains the difference of the two phase maps. And this term is now particularly interesting because the phase of this term actually does show a clear structure and is not speckled. And what is in fact happening here is that the microscopic phase perturbations at each single wavelength, they cancel each other out. And the phase map at the end contains only information uh, about the macroscopic path length variations, which are now on the order of the synthetic wavelengths. And what we do now is we take the so-called synthetic field here that we synthesized and now simply perform a numerical backpropagation at the synthetic wavelengths to obtain the reconstruction of our object. So backpropagation, again, is a wave optics term. Uh, you can basically think of this as the kind of computational reconstruction that assumes a known physical model, uh, in this case, the model of wave propagation. And we did this uh, for the non-line of sight geometry where, where we project like a laser on the wall and image the returned latent field uh, from the hidden object with a camera. And important here is that both camera and illumination object in this case is this uh, very small cutout letter N here. And I directly jump now to the results, um, which we captured for different synthetic wavelengths. And you see the captured synthetic phase maps on the top and the reconstructions here on the bottom. And what is so fascinating to see here is that the synthetic wave behaves exactly like an optical wave, which means that uh, the resolution of the reconstruction actually gets better with decreasing synthetic wavelengths. But also you see that measurements at smaller synthetic wavelengths are more susceptible to this degradation that we see here. And this degradation of the result uh, paired with the improvement of the resolution basically begs the question, are we approaching a limit here? Or if we formulate this question in a different way, how small can the synthetic wavelengths become? 
And uh, we calculated this and found that the synthetic wavelengths can actually not go below four times the maximal wavefront aberrations that are introduced by the scattering process uh, on wall and object. And um, this result is actually pretty striking because this is a limit that we already know from classical optics and that we have seen earlier when I was talking about speckle, right? So obviously um, this limit is now also true for the synthetic wavelengths, but in this case, the synthetic wavelengths is of course now much larger and uh, thus can tolerate much larger wavefront aberrations. What is also very striking here is that um, the synthetic wavelengths is actually a purely mathematical construct, which does not physically interact with the material. And um, this makes this result also very interesting. So in order to uh, estimate the performance of our system now, we can use the space bandwidth product uh, that I introduced earlier. And then we end up with this, which is uh, again, an uncertainty product now between uh, the width of the field of view that you can actually see around the corner and the resolution that you can achieve. And on the right side here, you have two system constants, which is the maximal wavefront aberration, which is basically dependent on the surface roughness or uh, for scattering media, the transport mean free path. And this here is the size of the virtual detector, uh, which is the size of the area on the wall that you observe. And um, a unique feature of synthetic wavelengths holography is now that we can adjust our synthetic wavelengths to different scenarios with stronger or weaker scattering. And so we can always approach this uh, theoretical limit very close. And this is something that can be nicely shown in the next experiment where we image now through scatterers or through scattering media in a transmissive setup. So the object here uh, in this case is this cutout letter U and it is hidden, as you can see, behind two scatterers. And <clears throat> in the first experiment, experiment, we image through a ground glass diffuser. And in the second experiment, we image through a milky plastic plate, which is basically comparable to one of these cutting boards where you cut your onions on. And this is approximately four millimeters thick in this uh, experiment. And you can already see in this photo here that the information of this checkerboard pattern that is placed behind this milky plastic plate is already completely scattered out, yeah? while you still see some checkers here for the ground glass diffuser. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we are actually able to nicely detect the object through the scatterer here. Uh, as expected, uh, the milky plastic uh, leads to larger wavefront aberrations which means that the measurements that you can see here, they deteriorate faster. But um, this measurement with the diffuser is also very interesting because um, the diffuser is a known part with uh, like a known grid size and so on. And this makes it possible for us to actually calculate the wavefront aberrations uh, in the diffuser. And our first order calculations here show us that these wavefront aberrations are indeed about a quarter of 280 micron, like the synthetic wavelengths that is uh, used here. And indeed, you see uh, that this reconstruction here is uh, shortly before deteriorating. So this means that this measurement here is actually very close to the absolute limit of what is physically possible. And uh, I also have to say that we know from other resolution experiments that this measurement actually reaches submillimeter resolution. And looking around corners or through scatterers with submillimeter resolution is something that would never be possible with other uh, current time of flight based approaches. Okay, so I mean, uh, I could show you now more nice experiments, but I think in the interest of time, I stop here and uh, jump now finally to the last project that I will show you today, um, which is also very, very related to this uh, thinking in limits. And this is the single shot 3D movie camera project, which is a single shot line triangulation sensor with high precision and high data density that enables uh, 3D videos of fast scenes, which are as good as physics and information theory allows. So this sensor is based on a measurement principle that is called triangulation. And just as a quick recap for all of you, triangulation is a very paradigmatic 
3D sensor principle because everybody of us, uh, also myself, already has a triangulation sensor built in since birth. And this is, uh, of course, the human vision system. So how does this work? So if we observe an object under two slightly different angles with two cameras or two eyes, yeah, we can basically calculate the distance of the object from the displacement of the two images in our two cameras or in our two eyes. This is also sometimes called disparity. Um, there is uh, uh, there is like a drawback to this. Uh, this only works here if the object has enough structure. So if we want to measure unstructured objects like a white wall, for example, what we have to do is we have to artificially structure the object by a projection. And uh, this can be simply done by projecting an image onto the object or by swapping one camera completely with the projector. And in the camera image, you will see then that uh, depending on the geometry and shape of the object, uh, the pattern in the camera image is deformed. And from this deformation, you can actually calculate the 3D data. So the single shot 3D movie camera project is basically inspired by uh, taking a close look at state of the art 3D sensing principles and recognizing that all these principles have at least one severe weak spot. So we saw before that off-the-shelf time-of-flight cameras are too unprecise for many applications. And for triangulation methods, which we are focusing on now, we have methods that rely on a temporal sequence of exposures, where the object has to remain perfectly still during the whole acquisition sequence. So this, these methods are not motion robust. And there is another class of triangulation sensors that uses all kinds of uh, spatially coded patterns. Like for example, this dot pattern that you see here, which is used in the first generation of the Microsoft Kinect sensor. Uh, the drawback here is that you need to read this code that you see here somehow. And uh, this consumes spatial bandwidth, which uh, in turn gives you a hit on data density and also introduces an inherent low pass filter on the data. And this means that fine structures of the object cannot be measured. This can be clearly seen in the results here. Yeah? And what I will present you now is a novel 3D sensor principle uh, that solves all three problems at the same time. And this is a movie cam, which is a sensor that is supposed to acquire a dense and precise 3D point cloud in each single camera frame. And in the end, this enables then a movie of 3D data points. Of course, we can ask now uh, why such a sensor does not exist yet. And to understand this, we have to answer two important questions. First, where are the limits for such a sensor principle? And second, how can these limits be reached? So as I said, the principle is based on uh, multi-line triangulation. And in standard multi-line triangulation, what you do is you project a pattern of narrow binary lines onto the object. And you observe this with a camera under a triangulation angle. And as I already said, from the deformation of each line in the camera image, you can basically calculate a nearly perfect 3D profile here. So. The principle is single shot and it preserves high spatial resolution, but only along each line. And between the lines, as you can see here, there is still much space. And this makes a dense surface acquisition impossible. So obviously there is no free lunch here, uh, but this problem actually seems quite easy to overcome, right? Yeah, you just have to project more lines. But um, the thing is, if we look more close on existing multi-line triangulation approaches, we see that these approaches are actually not able to project more than 10 or maybe 20 lines if no codification is applied. And unfortunately, uh, this is not just a technical problem. Uh, this problem has a fundamental character. Namely, the more lines we project, the harder it is for us to distinguish between the lines and to find out their right number uh, or also some sometimes called their right index. And this is especially true if the object contains high surface frequencies like these chumps that you see here. 
And if we draw this on a piece of paper, we see that the line density here is actually limited by two parameters, the unique measurement range delta Z and the triangulation angle theta, which defines the precision of our method. So again, we have an uncertainty relation here. And what happens if we ignore this uncertainty relation for now, and if we project too many lines on purpose, we see on this slide, so what happens is that the unique measurement range shrinks and we get these uh, typical indexing ambiguities, which is a, a well-known phenomena in 3D imaging that is always very problematic if you have no prior information about the object and you do not know in advance if the object surface itself really has these discontinuities or if this is actually an indexing error. Um, and this ambiguity problem actually bothered us for a long time and we searched for a solution, but uh, without sacrificing temporal resolution or temporal bandwidth and without sacrificing spatial bandwidth. And at the beginning uh, of this process, we came up with a pretty nice workaround to this problem, which is still not a full solution, but which I also want to show you here just because it's so nice. And uh, this is our measurement principle flying triangulation. And um, this is now the first of uh, several videos that I will show you in my talk. And uh, my previous experience with uh, Zoom uh, and these videos is that these videos will not play smoothly over Zoom, uh, which is why I gave you the links uh, here to my website on the bottom where you actually can find these videos. So you can open this right now or you can look at them later if you want, but on Zoom, unfortunately, they will not play smoothly. And I also have to say that there's one link for flying triangulation, which is this one. And later when I show uh, uh, the videos to the single shot 3 movie camera, there is another link for the single shot 3 movie camera. Okay, so uh, flying triangulation, what can we actually see here? So we see the sensor here, and we see that the sensor still projects sparse lines here, only sparse lines. But as soon as the measurement process starts, we have the hand-guided sensor that acquires a series of sparse data after another, and these data are then registered to each other in real time. And at the end, we have then a dense 3D model that is composed of many registered sparse single shot 3D views. And as you can see, this works quite well here, but I have to say that although each point that you see here is uh, acquired in single shot, the entire 3D model is actually not single shot. And this makes the measurement principle only robust against rigid object motion. So if the person would have opened his mouth, for example, then uh, the registration would have failed. So this means that uh, for the single shot 3D movie camera, we really have to tackle now the indexing problem. And for that, we uh, look back to our uncertainty relation here. And now we keep the line density fixed because we want to project a certain number of lines. And if we do that, we see that we are trapped. Why are we trapped? Because we can either get correctly indexed or precise data, but actually we want both. And the question, how can we get that? And it took us some time to realize the answer, which is actually quite uh, easy. So the answer is additional angular information, which is captured by a second camera. So what we do is we add an additional camera, and then we combine both cameras in a way so that one camera encloses a very small triangulation angle with the projection to generate a large measurement volume. And the other camera encloses a large triangulation angle with the projection to generate high precision. And the information of both cameras is then combined with an algorithm that we call the index back projection approach. And this works as follows. So uh, we take a picture of the scenery simultaneously with both cameras. Uh, in the image of camera one, the indices can be directly determined, but the 3D model is noisy due to the small triangulation angle. And in the image of camera two, the 3D model uh, displays higher precision, but falsely indexed data, as you can see here. And now comes the algorithmic trick. 
So uh, since both cameras are calibrated into the same system, one can simply back project the noisy data of camera one together with their index information onto the chip of camera two. And on the chip, the back projections overlap. And by that, uh, the correct index can be assigned to every line on camera two. And the result is then a correctly indexed 3D model with high precision. And this also works for daily life objects like a human face, for example, where you can see that the 3D model here can be freely turned and watched from different perspectives, basically like a hologram. And uh, since this is now really acquired in single shot, we can simply acquire many single shots after another uh, during a non-rigid movement of the object. And by that, we end up with a 3D movie of 3D data points. And again, the link to the videos that I show now is uh, here on the bottom. So this is a, a zoom in in the 3D movie. And I have to emphasize here that what I show here is uh, only raw data of the sensor. So there's no post-processing or no interpolation involved um, on the models that I show here. So each point that you see here is an individually measured 3D point with high precision, so 20, uh, 200 microns in this case. And since there is also no pattern codification and no spatial correlation involved, uh, the edges are also very nicely preserved, which you can see here in this kind of like accordion uh, experiment. So this is something that would not never be possible with the Microsoft Kinect sensor, for example. Okay. So um, I introduced you now the basic principle of the single shot 3D movie camera. And uh, now let's talk a little bit about like in the remaining five minutes or so, let's talk a little bit about where are the physical and information theoretical limits of this method. Uh, method. And the first limit that I want to discuss is the limitation of the distance precision. And this goes now a little bit into optics again. So, um, and if you're not so familiar with optics, just bear with me and I will show you like another nice trick after the next slide. Okay, so we know from decades of research in Erlangen that uh, the dominant noise source for active single shot triangulation is speckle noise. And uh, the distance precision in presence of speckle is actually given by this formula here where lambda is the wavelength, uh, theta is the triangulation angle, and u is the observation aperture. And an essential role here plays the speckle contrast, which is basically the inverse signal to noise ratio. And to improve the distance precision now, you need to perform a physical optimization of the speckle contrast. And a central role here plays the temporal and the spatial coherence of the illumination. And we did this optimization and eventually we experimentally evaluated the distance precision and we got values between 200 microns and only 17 microns in the very best case. And you can actually see uh, or you can actually show uh, that this is very close to the limit of what is physically possible for multi-line triangulation setups. And uh, the second limit that I quickly want to mention is the limit of the line density. So I think you will all believe me if I say that the lines have to be separable in the camera image. And this separability is basically uh, dependent on those three factors here. And without going into detail here, we calculated that the theoretical maximum of lines that can be projected is uh, 100 uh, lines, uh, 160 lines for a one megapixel camera. And our sensor also operates at this limit, meaning that we can reach this limit at this number in our setup. But it actually turns out uh, that with a very simple trick, we can even nearly double this number again. And uh, this is by the projection of a crossed line pattern. And the gag here is now that you can achieve this even without introducing additional cameras, only by a slight displacement, or a displacement of the cameras that are already in the system. So in fact, what we do here is we create four triangulation sensors with only two cameras. And um, this is how such a 3D model with crossed patterns look like. 
uh, you see how dense the object is sampled here. So each point on each line here is an individually measured 3D point. And with this, uh, we can acquire nearly a third of a million uh, independent 3D points in each one megapixel single shot. And um, yeah, last but not least, uh, we also evaluated our principle under information theoretical aspects. So I also just want to briefly mention this here because this makes like a 30 minutes talk for itself. But what we did is we started uh, at the information theoretical model for 3D sensors. And then we used um, Shannon's channel capacity to come up with an information theoretical figure of merit that can be used to quantify different 3D imaging principles. And this is what we call the channel efficiency. And I need to direct you to my PhD thesis for this uh, because I will not explain in detail what all these terms here mean, but uh, uh, the basic construct is uh, output information in form of a 3D image divided by input information in form of 2D images. And what comes out here uh, of this estimation is that our sensor performs around eight to 10 times better than other single shot principles here. And it reaches basically the same performance as the multi-shot principle phase measuring triangulation, PMT, which is known to be the gold standard uh, in terms of efficiency. And before I close my talk, uh, just a quick side note. So of course we can also do this with color cameras as well. So uh, this here is an image of the prototype sensor where you see the preview of the 3D model on the screen. And this is how such a colored uh, 3D model looks like. Still, we show only raw data here of the sensor, no post-processing, no interpolation involved. And I think many people in the audience already can imagine what you can actually do with a sensor that outputs raw data in this quality. Yeah, and this is the last video that I show, um, which basically shows the real-time capability of the sensor. So even if we use uh, slow cameras uh, working at 30 frames per second, we are still able to image or resolve this jumping ping pong ball here uh, without any motion artifact. And uh, this can become very important for the 3D inspection of um, very fast processes, like for example, crash tests or bullet impacts or exploding airbags and so on. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, as a last slide, I actually would like to show a slide that I have adapted from Gerd Häusler because it basically summarizes on a high level what I showed you today. And this is the canonical model for an optical sensor. So we just learned that uh, such a sensor is always composed of a light source, uh, the surface that we want to measure, and an optical and electronical system, like a camera and a computer, that evaluates the encoded information. And we actually also learned that the illumination is very important and uh, we have now many modalities that we need to choose from, from uh, for the illumination. So the illumination can be coherent, can be structured, can be pulsed, you name it, basically. And for all these illumination modalities, the object actually looks different and reveals different information. Also, the interaction with the surface plays a role. So we can have specular reflection, can be incoherent, volume scattering, and so on. And finally, we also have to decide which modality we actually want to observe. Is it intensity? Is it frequency? Is it time of light? And so on. And all these modalities or all these possibilities actually sum up to uh, over 8,000 possible embodiments of sensors that you can actually invent. What does this mean? I mean, first, this means that computational imaging is a vast play field that brings you a lot of fun. But this also means that you need to understand the limits to find the right sensor for your application and to get the best possible performance of your method. And that's it. Um, unfortunately, I did not get a chance to talk uh, all about the other projects that are going on in our lab but uh, maybe I can do this at uh, a different occasion sometimes. And um, I mean, 
I hope I was able to convince you in this talk uh, that limits are not always a bad thing, especially if you know how to exploit them for the optimization of your device and for bargaining with nature. And if you want to know more about our work, uh, please write me an email. Oops. Yeah, please write me an email or have a look at uh, these websites here. And um, the only thing that is left to say now from my side is thank you for your attention. Thank you for the presentation. I do have some applause for you. And I hope you can hear that. Mm -hmm. So thank you nobody, very much. Nobody in US is doing that actually. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I thought you need some applause that yeah. you have the feeling of an audience. I mean, yeah. you have quite a few people really in the audience, but uh, mm. the clapping is just too much for Zoom. <laughs> Say this is really, really amazing results, amazing software, in particular also the ones that you can do with commodity hardware. Do you also publish your software accessible? Can you share it? Um, is, is yes. It so um, we are about, so we already have published the open source software package for um, actually for the skin um, scan uh, application, which is uh, also a cooperation, I should say, with the uh, Pattern Recognition Lab in Erlangen. And uh, this is downloadable on GitHub, and uh, you can find a link to that on my website. Excellent. And uh, I will try to also put that link in the description of the video, mm -hmm. such that um, the audience can also find that after your presentation. So that's pretty cool. It's really amazing how much of open source software is going on and how people share and how this actually pushes research. Say, so when you apply these uh, illumination uh, do you have to control the light in the room? Um, can you do that in daylight? Do you need um, a, a rather dark room or how is that? So this is a, actually a very good question. And it also goes like very deep into this question um, uh, in 3D imaging, why there are actually multi-shot principles in 3D imaging. So why can you not get the 3D information by only looking at one image for some principles? And I mean, you can, right? I just introduced your single shot principle, but the drawback of this is that still, I mean, the, the data are pretty dense, but they are not pixel dense. Yeah? So there's still not a 3D data point in each single pixel, but you can do this with a multi-shot principle. But the drawback, and I will answer your question now, uh, the drawback with these multi-shot principles is that you need uh, more than one image, you actually need at least three image uh, images. And this has a very deep reason, because if you project a pattern, and if you look at the intensity, uh, like in each pixel, the intensity is basically composed of three unknowns, which is the face of the pattern, or in general, the pattern that you want to have, this is what you want to know. But you also have two other unknowns, which is and now comes your question, the background illumination yeah, and the reflectivity of the object. Yeah? So this means background illumination or is, uh, can be a big problem, yeah? especially if you use uh, patterns which are intensity encoded, which means which have different gray values, then it's a big problem. It's not such a big problem if you use patterns that are binary. Yeah? And there are also like cases where the background illumination might completely overwhelm the signal. Like for example, when you measure in plain sunlight, yeah, then the sunlight might be actually much brighter than your projection. Then you can play like some filtering tricks, for example, then you can uh, project some infrared uh, patterns and apply a filter in front of your camera or something like that. <laughs> yeah, so that's a really relevant factor. And, uh... mm -hmm be good to be aware about that so yeah. also um, maybe illumination we just two weeks ago we had this nice invited talk by timothy odonga and he made a point how the skin the, how the skin tones can actually be a factor since you're extracting 3d is this a possible remedy yeah so it's actually funny because i actually wanted to comment on that and i forgot <laughs> during the talk <laughs> so this is something that we are currently uh, looking at yeah how different skin tones uh, especially for the skin scan project how different skin tones affect 
the outcome of our 3D measurement. But mm -hmm. the general idea of this uh, skin scan project is actually that uh, you use the 3D data or you use the 3D information to actually strap away the color because the color might actually spoil you out. They have some measurement principles, the color, inf the color of the skin or the color of the melanoma or something like that influences the result. And in the ideal case, we get the same 3D data for different skin tones, of course. And this is something that we currently um, looking at. <laughs> Very interesting. So uh, it would be great if, if it could help with that problem, because it's also something that kind of boggles me. And of course, I would yeah. like to create fair systems that are applicable to a broad range of patients. So it is actually, I mean, it actually also boils down a little bit how you tune your parameters, right? Hmm. And um, it would be great to have like a kind of principle that is adaptable or like automatically adapts to different situations yeah? and it kind of automatically recognizes different situations, scanning situations, and then automatically, automatically adapts the parameters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. S speaking of parameter tuning, you showed this nice effect that when you're working with the, the scatterers, that the wavelengths essentially boil down to different resolutions. And it turns out that, of course, the the way how you can visualize the letters, for example, was very different over different resolutions. So does it make sense to combine then multiple wavelengths to, to compose a single image? Is that something that would be worth exploring? Yeah, I did not have time to go into that, but actually you can play this game further. This is also like, you can have a look at uh, the paper that I cited, for example, we do this here. Um, so if you combine multiple synthetic wavelengths, yeah, in fact, what you are doing then is uh, you interfere multiple synthetic wavelengths. And in fact, what you are doing is you are creating a synthetic pulse. Yeah? And this enters then a regime where the whole principle gets like very similar or like, like very close to uh, OCT imaging and uh, white light interferometry. So this is something, this is definitely something that you can do and which also gives you an improvement. Cool. So what, what laser powers do you need for imaging through scatterers? Um, so our laser in our lab is fairly weak. Uh, it only has a 140 milliwatt. Um, this is also the reason why we did the experiments that we have or that we showed. They are all just like small scale experiments. But um, for this looking around corner project that I was actually talking about, yeah, uh, the challenge from, from the funding agency was to do this at real standoff, like for realistic scene, yeah? uh, which means at, uh, like, for example, detect a person yeah? that uh, uh, stands in front of a wall and is like one meter or like even more than one meters away from the wall. And for this, in order to do this, you would need very high laser powers. So, um, one watt and over uh, larger than one watt at two. Mm -hmm. Also very impressive the work with the 3D sensor that you can get very, uh, very good resolution also in terms of depth, which is pretty cool. When I look at some of the videos, it seemed that in the in the shadow of the nose, some of the 3D information was missing. Is that due to the angle that uh, essentially the, the frequency gets too high that you can't extract the information? No, there? it's basically occlusion. It's occlusion. Mm. So the nose is, especially the nose of some people, is uh, can be very large, and <laughs> this leads uh, sometimes to occlusions, right? And when where is no light, you cannot measure something, right? So the, uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, and one thing that is also so you have rather large gaps in between the grids. Um, did, did you think about using interpolation techniques to fill that to get a better appearance? Yeah, so there are several. So I intentionally showed in this talk, I intentionally showed the raw data of the sensor, right? Just to this, like, because normally when you see 3D models from some sensors, they are all in some way prettified, yeah? Which means they use like um, interpolation or something like that to prettify the data. And I intentionally showed the raw data. So if you have raw data with this kind of quality, you can actually do a lot of stuff, yeah? To do this so as you mentioned 
you can do interpolation, yeah, but you can also do something that is related to this fly trial principle. So, for example, because the distance between two lines now is actually pretty small now, yeah. So, what you can do is you can quickly shift your pattern around, or you can build a hand guided sensor that and shift the pattern over the object. So, in in like in actually, if you do this and if you apply kind of registration process that I showed you for flying triangulation, but now with this very high line number of 160 lines or 160 cross lines, you can get a super dense representation of the object in a very short amount of time. Or you just do interpolation, no? which just also works very nice. Yeah, so there's very nice uh, edge preserving mm -hmm. techniques. And then again, you still have the associated uh, RGB image that you can also use to drive the interpolation. So that, that would be actually an interesting project to do. I'm not sure how much you have already done with that, um, but... Could not much, that. actually. I think there's there's quite a few things that can be done in, in close to real time, but very simple techniques. Mm -hmm. so we had a very, very good experiences with post-processing of tongue flight images. And <laughs> also very interesting observations with holes uh, disappearing in calibration patterns and then figuring out that the sensor uh, that is supposedly give you raw data is not actually giving you as much raw data. So we were looking <laughs> to calibrating time of flight cameras with a checkerboard pattern where they, you essentially cut holes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting images where the checkerboard pattern with supposed holes is just, just a single plane. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there's some pre-processing happening. You, you cannot, this. yeah, you cannot really access that maybe, right? So it's, it can yeah. be a big problem yeah, if you want to have the raw data. Yeah. Exactly. So Florian, this was a huge pleasure to have you here. A very vivid Thank discussion. You. Thank you very much for being so responsive and you answered many of our questions. Really great. Thank you. So I have another round of applause for you. So thanks for coming here. Yeah. It's very good to hear this. <laughs> and unfortunately, that already concludes our sessions today. As you can see, we had a vivid discussion of Florian's ideas and I enjoyed his presentation in particular. I really liked the new sensors that he developed that can do this high resolution 2.5D imaging and in particular with this high accuracy and depth. So I think that's really a very cool imaging technique and I'm very much looking forward to more results of Florian in the coming years. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation as much as I did. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them either in the comments or send them to me by email. I will forward them to Florian. And of course, I would be very happy to welcome you again in the next episode of Beyond the Patterns. Thank you very much for watching and bye-bye.